going to be hard to match the uh, giveaway. I don't have any prizes. Uh, but my lecture is online. Uh, you can download that because, uh, well, we're going to be going through this kind of like you go through the pictures in our dermatology book, trying to figure out what's wrong with this patient. Right? Everybody does that. I do it too. What does that look like? Uh, it looks most like this. So this is a lot of just looking at stuff. So there's not going to be a whole lot of text. And there's more material here than I'm going to have time for. So some of the stuff I may not get to, and you're welcome to look at that on your own afterward. So with that, there we go. I don't want to miss the chance to welcome you to Savannah now that the course is almost, the conference is almost over. Uh, Savannah is the first capital of Georgia and the first city of Georgia, and also the home of the Girl Scouts of America. So there's your pieces of trivia you can share with at your next cocktail party. <clears throat> Okay, with that then, let's go. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the eye. I have this there as a reference for you, so you can go back to it later on. It's like, what was that part that he was talking about? Because it's going to take too long, and there's lots more eyeball pictures and anatomy pictures on the internet. So you do have to have some kind of understanding of eyeball anatomy, so it's there for as a reference. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. The slide will move. All right, as with everything else that you're doing in the emergency department, and sometimes we kind of will fudge on a little bit, you have to do, get some historical information. If you don't have a good history, you're, gonna, you're who knows where, out there in the woods trying to find your way back home. So find out, is there a history of loss of vision? Is it ongoing? Was it transient? Was it partial? Was it on one eye, both eyes? Or just kind of up in one quadrant on both eyes? Uh, and your patients will sometimes get it wrong, and you're going to have to tease through that very carefully. Is there pain involved? It makes a difference. Some eye conditions are painless, other ones are painful, and you have to know that. What other medical problems do they have? You know, is there that underlying collagen vascular disease or some kind of arthropathy that they have that's, that may be spilling over to now eye complaints? And of course, tetanus status. Visual acuity. Uh, the Snell eye chart's kind of the standard on this stuff, uh, but if they can't even read the top letter, then maybe they can count fingers. Can they see movement? Okay. Can you see light, dark? That may be all that they can perceive. Get the you know a otoscope or something shine up smack dab in their eye, or turn the lights off and on in the room. Uh, confrontational visual fields. Everybody hates those suckers. Okay. Uh, you can do it with both eyes, but realize that you're not getting anything in the nasal section. So you're going to have to tease out with each eye. You know, left and right. Do the quadrants. Then do the other eye. You may pick up those, that quadrinopia that they have as part of their stroke uh, picture. Uh, and if they forgot their glasses, which they often do, remember you can uh, improve their visual acuity by letting them look through a pinhole to look at the eye chart. And for our uh, illiterate patients or our uh, preschoolers, there are other uh, variations on the uh, eye chart that you can use, the tumbling ease or the, uh, the preschool pictures there. Who picked umbrella? That's just too big a word for little kids, isn't it? All right, as you're examining the patient and you're doing an eye exam, Rather than it just kind of being hit and miss, and oh, I need to remember to do this. Oh, let's do this now. Let's. Uh, it's if you stay organized and have a pattern, then you won't forget to do things. And a good way to do this is just use the use the body as your roadmap, and just kind of start far away and move in. So in this case, this is kind of ordered for you here. Face, then the tissues around the eye, including the eyebrows, the eyelids, the eyelashes, the conjunctiva, not just the one that's on the sclera, but the one on, under the upper and lower lid, so the palpebral, palpebral, the pal hebral conjunctiva, extraocular muscles, then take a look at the pupils, anterior chamber, your fundoscopic examination, and intraocular pressure. So you do all those things and you're not going to miss anything. It's all there. The slit lamp. If you have one, are you using it? Or is this one of those things like, it's back there, but I hate using it because it's got so many knobs on it, I can't figure it out. If you have one, learn to use it. You will do a much better job taking care of your patients. I promise you, it is not that difficult. No matter what brand scope you have or slit lamp you have, it can only do so many things. And there's a place for each one of those things to happen. So look at it, fiddle with all the knobs in your private time, practice on one of your colleagues, and then start practicing on your patients. If you are not using the slit lamp, how many of you are using a woods lamp? Yeah, I'm seeing hands go up. You're using the wrong instrument, okay? It does not have the ideal frequency of light to, to get optimal uh, fluorescing of the fluorescein. You're going to pick up some stuff, uh, more subtle corneal abrasions, more subtle things you're going to miss. The magnification is meager at best. 
Uh, I would argue you might as well be using a seeing eye dog and just listen to the dog bark once or twice. Uh, is there pathology or not? It, it is the wrong device. If that's what you're using, get a slit lamp. If you have it, start using it. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, you will see your, uh, your eye capabilities and eye understanding go up asymptotically. Ah, uh, the ophthalmoscope. I know a bunch of my medical students and my residents hate that sucker. I've got one of my physical diagnosis students here. She knows how much I beat up on them to make sure that they start learning how to use this thing properly. You gotta learn how to use it. If you have trouble with it, if you're bad at it, I tell you what, if you don't practice, you're not gonna get any better. So get it down. Every patient that you have has two eyeballs. Even if they're there with an ankle complaint, if you ask them, would you mind if I take a look at your eyes? 99% of the patients say, sure doc. Is it important? No, I just want to, just, just take a look, just like I'm listening to your heart, let me just practice looking at your eyeballs here. You're gonna to have to tell them the practice part, okay? The more you do it, the better you get. That's all I can say. Uh, if you have the fancy panoptic, fine. Uh, makes it easier. Don't forget to check intraocular pressures. So regardless of whether you're using old technology with the, with the Shiats or the, uh, one of the newer ones, uh, or maybe the one that's on your slit lamp, the applanation tonometry, which takes a little extra skill set, the kind that has the condom on the end or the nail gun. Uh, I care, I think they don't like nail gun. But I call it nail gun. Uh, they're all great devices, uh, progressively simple. If you're using everything except the eye gun, make sure that you anesthetize the eyeball because you're touching the eyeball. That's why your patient's pulling away because you forgot to numb up the eyeball. Uh, the nail gun, uh, by the time you get the pressure, they blink, it's already done. Okay, so your patient presents, and this is what they see, not the word sudden, everything else, <coughs> on one eye. All right, so you very quickly run through your differential diagnosis, and what could it be? I think I'm gonna have to take a look in the eyeball. And you peek, oh, ah, I gave that away. Um, you look in there, and what do you see? And this is what you see. And you go, ooh, this is bad. What is it? Okay, if you're answering, I think it's a blood blue supermoon, then you're a few weeks behind, and because uh, we just had one of those, and it's not what it is. Come on. Okay, we're looking at central retinal artery occlusion here. Okay, so the optic disc is a little blurred, the entire disc is a little pale, and you can see the cherry red spot. Can you see the cherry red spot? There it is, right here. Here's the optic disc, there's just maybe a little hemorrhage here, and you've got the bright red spot there, which you not, should normally not be able to distinguish in the background. That's bad. Okay, so this is painless. It is sudden onset, not gradual. Just like I was, I was watching TV and all of a sudden I couldn't see out of this eye. Okay, it's a monocular blindness. Uh, if you do uh, checking pupillary responses, you will find that there's an afferent pupillary defect because they have lost vision. Okay, currently enough two on that side is out. Okay, so then. Uh, you're not going to be able to pick that up. They'll still be able to constrict because cranial nerve three is still intact. The cherry red spot's still there because of the uh, different blood supply. More on that in just a second. Uh, if you look really hard, you may see some box scarring. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Okay, so what you need to do here is lower intraocular pressure, some gentle massage, it's gentle, not just super duper light, but firm, but not enough to immediately rip off the, the retina. You don't want to go that hog wild on it. But by the same token, it needs to be aggressive enough because they're losing their vision right now in front of you. You have about 30 minutes, or 90 minutes, excuse me, to restore the vision. And if you don't do that, they're going to lose the vision anyway. So if you end up detaching the retina, who cares? Because they're going to have to lose the eye. Uh, decreasing PCO2 uh, is worthwhile. Giving carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, beta blockers, all things to lower the interocular pressure and try and get the clots to move a little more peripheral and try and restore some of that vision, restore the blood supply. Um, TPA, by the way, uh, gets brought up every once in a while. The, the few meager studies that are out there suggest that right now there's no statistical uh, improvement by offering TPA. You offer the complications, but there's really not any improvement with patients with vision. So you can hold off on the TPA. It makes sense, it seemed intuitive that you should be able to do that, but right now it's not there. Stay tuned, maybe that'll still be changing. There's box scarring where the little arrows are. Uh, when you do your frontoscopic examination, you will not get the benefit of arrows being there. You're just going to have to be patient and look carefully. So it's not just, oh, I got red reflex and I saw a flash of the disc and I'm done. Look a little harder. Look at those vessels. 
If you do this often enough, you're gonna start appreciating uh, venous pulsations, or actually even distinguishing arteries from veins. My arteries are a little bit smaller, veins are a little bit bigger. You're gonna start seeing venous pulsations. You're gonna see copper wiring, silver wiring. You might pick up some cotton wool spots, plaques and hemorrhages, uh, angioneoplasia on your diabetics. There's so much good stuff to see, but you have to get the fundoscope, uh, phthalmoscope off the wall and take a look in the eyeball. Okay, there's a normal versus a central retinal artery occlusion side by side. All right, next. Oh, quiz. What's the first branch off the internal carotid artery? I'm pimp you like back in medical school. Answer is deafening silence. Okay, ophthalmic artery. And why is there a cherry red spot back in the back? Told you there's an alternate circulation. It has to do. There it is. The red spot. Okay, it's because of the. Uh, uh, vascular supply from the uh, choroid, which is done through the ciliary vessels, which are other branches that come off the ophthalmic artery. And there's that picture, and it's there for your reference, and you can like, look at it later on. Because you have to look at it and find, read the fine, fine print to find which artery is which. But that's what that's about. Okay. I had, this is what I saw in my eye for a little while, and after five minutes, it came back again. It scared the bejesus out of me, and here I am in the ER. My vision's back 100% now, 2020. So this is just nothing more than uh, amaurosis fugax, uh, most likely due to a, uh, what would have otherwise ended up in a central retinal artery occlusion because of an amdolic phenomenon. But keep in mind, there can be other things that cause that, including migraines, a temporal arteritis. Usually it's kind of later in that stage of that illness. That's what you want to avoid. And if you can snag that, you can reverse that. Um, um, papilledema, uh, perhaps from pseudotumor, and a young person now who shouldn't be at stroke risk. Uh, hypertensive emergencies, because this may be the sign of their end organ damage, and uh, Renaud's can have that. Uh, actually, have some eye findings as well with uh, loss of vision. Let's skip past this. You can look at these things on your leisure, but just kind of keep in mind temporal arteritis, arteritis when you have those patients, those elderly patients with a bad headache, maybe a little blurring of their vision, and it's kind of sore here. It hurts when they chew. Uh, and again, you have to pick up the uh, phthalmoscope to be able to pick up papilledema, because that may be what's, what tips you off to decide, gee, I do need to do a, a lumbar puncture on this lady and check her uh, uh, pre opening pressures and maybe let off a little fluid and see if her headache doesn't go away uh, and before she loses her vision. So uh, you can use ultrasound uh, to diagnose papilledema. Some folks are finding that easier to use than the uh, ophthalmoscope. Fine, go for it. I'm not gonna go there right now. And, yeah. All right, I had this gradual um, dimming of my vision over the last few hours, and this is what I see now. Hmm, it doesn't hurt. Okay, this is gonna be central retinal rain occlusion. So it's typically associated with very high blood pressures, uh, maybe related to those arteries as they're crossing veins and cutting off the blood supply, but you're basically gonna back up the blood in those veins, there's going to be uh, transient that's leaking exudate across the, uh, the uh, venous membranes. So you're going to see retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, edema, uh, and the classic description is blood and thunder. So there's normal and blood and thunder side by side. I don't know who makes up these names. A few beers on board. <clears throat> there's another example, blood and thunder. Okay, yeah, I've seen one, it was actually in developing country. Okay, did I just go through past two slides? I did. So, oh well, well, here it is, retinal attachment is next. So it's gonna be with some loss of vision or distortion of vision. Uh, if you're lucky, you may be able to peek in there. If it's a really big peel off, then you can actually see the retina as it's bowing out uh, into the uh, ocular cavity. Okay. Um, Typically uh, preceded by this description of flashing lights, um, floaters, spider webs, all those things. You hear those words, basically you're gonna be referring that patient to an ophthalmologist. Uh, you may be able to diagnose it, in which case you're gonna refer them to the ophthalmologist. If you can't diagnose it, you're gonna refer them to the ophthalmologist, right? It's either way. Um, it seems like it was taught, uh, beat into us, like this is like an emergency, they need to go like in the next five minutes. The reality is you can usually wait a little bit, it can be done over hours or even the next morning. 
my death was actually over the weekend, so Monday morning, uh, and uh, you'll be fine. He was fine. Um, so um, you, know, you cannot rule it out just on your fundoscopic examination. If you're good with ultrasound, then you may be able to distinguish that. Um, but you may see any one of these things where there's distortions, bucklings, the vessels all of a sudden stop and then pick up, and it seems like a different layer, a different elevation. So just looking closely. If you're doing ultrasound, um, I'm not here to teach you how to do that, but um, as my understanding is that if you can follow the, the, the bright white line there, this line right here to the shadow here, which is the shadow that's cast by the, uh, the optic disc, that seems to tether to that because the retina is actually kind of an extension of that sheet, uh, then that suggests it's a uh, retinal uh, detachment. If it floats above that, are there all of those? Um, there. If it's floating above that, like this one is, here's the shadow where the white membrane is up here, then that suggests it's just a vitreous detachment. Over here, you can see it. This one here, both layers seem to just be anchored and tethered against the optic uh, disc itself. So that means uh, retinal detachment. Okay. Young person who's just witnessed a traumatic event. I don't want to spend a real long time on this. <coughs> but they say, I can't see anything. They seem to be a little bit blase about it. Uh, maybe hysterical blindness that, that you're uh, seeing. So an optic kinetic drum. All of us have one of those on our ERs, right? <coughs> sure. Uh, not even that. I'll show you a trick around that, though. Uh, but as you spin that thing, because remember those rudimentary mechanisms, we automatically track motion. If you do that, you're immediately going to see them uh, develop, have a nice tagness. So if you just flash something in front of them, and a piece of EKG rhythm strip you know, it's, that you have, usually have miles of that nobody looks at, that are shooting out of the monitor, right? You all know what I'm talking about. Just grab you know, a length of that. Hold it firmly in one hand, and the other one put it between your two fingers, and then just kind of slide it in front of the patient, just shoop, okay, just horizontally, and you will see them. If you see them just kind of having this nice diagonal, like the picture here in our little video, uh, they're obviously seeing it, they're tracking it, and picking up on it, and responding with a motor, uh, a motor response. Their vision is intact. This is hysterical blindness, okay? And you see a psychiatrist, not an ophthalmologist. So EKG paper has other uses. Okay, uh, gradual decrease in vision. It's just kind of gray. Kind of came on over days. Maybe even weeks. Okay, so here we're talking about optic neuritis. Uh, so it's inflammation of the optic nerve. Uh, so long course, generally painless. Uh, they may have some pupillary abnormality, uh, response abnormalities. And one of the uh, hallmarks of this is they lose their color vision. So. You take a look, you may see papilledema from the inflammatory response, and this is what they're gonna describe to you. My vision's a little blurry, and just kind of, I lost the color of my vision, as opposed to being able to see sharp in those colorful details. So this is MS, or MS, it might be MS. Multiple sclerosis might be an option. Think about MS. Uh, MS is yet another consideration, then there's kind of a long list of, then just kind of blank space, there's nothing, and then there's MS three more times, okay? Get them to the ophthalmologist, uh, they will be treating them with steroids. Um, and maybe a, some uh, corrective uh, prismatic lenses to, or, or sheets to put in their glasses to correct some of their uh, dip, double vision. Okay, this one is uh, gradual loss of vision. There's pain and the eye is red. Ask a little bit more and uh, as you're looking at your patient, doorway diagnosis kind of thing, it's just on one eye. I was at a movie theater and it got dark and then as the movie was going along, I was like, man, my eye's starting to hurt. I got this headache, it's really bad. Um, and this is, bum, bum, bum. Acute angle closure glaucoma. So um, there it is. Your, your pressures are typically in the order of about uh, 50 um, millimeters of mercury. So much higher than the normal kind of range. Uh, you start getting that 25 range. It's kind of sus kind of suspicious, but 50 is a slam dunk. Uh, it's the hot, steamy cornea that you're going to see. Uh, erythema around that from the conjunctiva. Pupil may be small, not quite as reactive as the other side, and it all has to do with the plugging of the Schlem's canals. And I'm not going to delve into that right now. But basically, the normal aqueous flow is being impeded, and pressure is backing up in the uh, in the eyeball. So there it is again. 
as we move on. Oh, one more thing. Uh, if you're really slick, if you bring in a light source from way over laterally and shine it across, then you may actually see the, um, the iris look a little bit like a somewhat shallow volcano. It's, instead of the iris being flat like it's supposed to be, it bulges forward. And you'll, if you shine a light from the side, then you cast a shadow on the back side, and that shadow is seen there, and it's diagrammed as that little shaded area on the picture. That's what you're looking for, is that, that shadow being cast. That'll be your first test even before you get out your tonometer. Okay, and the treatment of uh, for glaucoma, and I've got it here for your reference in a cookbook kind of thing, but the basis is decrease the amount of fluid production and increase the outflow. And that's what all the different drops and uh, IV medication that you're going to give these patients, that's what that's all about. Okay, decrease production, increase outflow. Get that intraocular pressure down. Okay, and at some point, then the eye doctor may have to pop some holes into the uh, iris to give the fluid a different way to escape. So it's there uh, over several slides, uh, just boom, boom, boom. This is what you give, this is what you do. Okay, and then you're, at some point, your ophthalmologist will answer the phone call late at night because that's when these always happen, it seems like. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, good idea, yeah, that's, that's good. I'll maybe hold off on that, I'll come in, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Okay, there's the last of the drops. All right, what's wrong with this? Painful red eye. I give very short histories. It's almost like the uh, national boards. Painful eye, the diagnosis is? If you look close, that one on the, uh, on the right looks like it's got a little white stuff at the bottom. That's not an Arcus senilis. Nope, not Arcus senilis. Arcus senilis should be circumferential, not just a little gravity-dependent place. Okay, that's pus on the eyeball. It's white blood cells. Okay, so it's called, the $5 word is hypopion. Okay, you're also seeing the limbic flush, so normally the limbus is clear with a lot of things, like conjun uh, typical conjunctivitis, but in this case, the area right around where the cornea attaches to the sclera is all angry and red and inflamed. So this is iritis. This is iritis, it's quite painful. They are not going to appreciate bright lights being shown in their eye. This is not the person to start practicing frontoscopic or slit lamp exams on. You do need to take a look, but don't spend a long time on those. Um, you will actually see white blood cells in the anterior chamber, not, even if it's not enough to layer out, but you may see it on the slit lamp examination. I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, pupil is typically on the small side. You will a lot of times give uh, medication to uh, relax that and decrease the spasm that occurs when light gets shined into either eye, part of that consensual response. So if you look with the slit lamp, okay, and you're never going to see this on a Woods lamp. I mean, remember, Woods lamp is kind of like me looking at the person in the third row versus me looking at the person that's sitting here in front of the, micro the microphone, okay? It's that difference in magnification, okay? So you're actually looking at white blood cells there in the anterior chamber. It looks a little bit like a snow globe. You see the things just kind of gently kind of floating around and glittering a little bit. Uh, and sometimes you'll have that Tyndall effect from just the colloidal suspension. This is just kind of hazy that's there from the protein that's in there. And if you look at how wide the slit needs to be, you see it's just truly a slit of, of light, not two or three millimeters, a fraction of a millimeter. Very small. And crank it up to high magnification. Good fun stuff. So there's another hypopion. You can see it layering up very nicely. And one more. Oh, and one more with a nasty corneal uh, ulcer in front of it, which is setting this off. So that one I presume to be infectious. This is high risk for losing the eye from infection. All right, um, let's see. This patient's complaining of irritation. It's itchy, it's light sensitive, and the eyeball, and it's a little bit of redness. Looks like he's got some fluorescein that someone's already put into his eye. Kind of like after, the, after they found the good pathology, they went back and took pictures. What do you think? I don't see much. Let's take a closer look. A really close look. You're not going to see this with the woods lamp. You're going to miss it. See the little white things there? Do they look a little dendritic? It's because they are. If we stain it with a little higher magnification, we might see this if we're lucky. And on test questions, if you see a test question of something about that suggests maybe it's supposed to be uh, herpetic. And you see the answer, Rose Bengal, that's the answer, you're done. Move to the next question. Okay, it's a, 
No, no ER has it, we never do it. Ophthalmologists, there's a few residents I've spoken to about it, hate it because it's a timed thing, and you have to get just the right concentration, leave it on for so many seconds, and you have to look right then, otherwise you're gonna, it's not gonna pick up right. So anyway, rose bengal, herpetic infection of the eyeball. Now maybe you got a clue that a tip off that the patient uh, has this rash on their face, so maybe they've got the uh, um, blisters, the vesicles on the tip of the nose, the Hutchinson side, and they've got the rest of the herpetic rash there in the V1 and 2 on their trigeminal nerve. This is kind of spillover combination. There's another one that's a little bit more, um, there is, a uh, little more ophthalmic distribution. Okay. Uh, these are going to be uh, referred to the ophthalmologist for further care. All right, eye pain. This patient's been stained with fluorescein. Look for the fluorescein. And it's just a simple corneal abrasion. That's all there is to it. Now maybe it's a little bit, you know, be a little more involved, perhaps it's from a, with a burn uh, from an airbag deployment. Uh, <laughs> as the powder, or the powder gets up and it's still uh, on fire uh, with combusting. I hit the eye, so you get some pretty nasty injuries from uh, airbags. <coughs> Let's not spend any time on uh, corneal abrasions. You know how to manage those. But be aware of the uh, of ice skaters lesions. Everyone's heard of those. Here's a picture of them. They really do exist. Okay. How about this innocuous little white spot there on the cornea? It's been hurting for a couple of days. It's getting worse. And I wear contact lenses. Oh, history. It's all in the history. So um, watch out for those pseudomonas infections. Those get referred to the eye doctors okay, uh, promptly. Uh, they'll have some concoction of stuff that includes anti-pseudomonal uh, stuff, and they'll be watching them, seeing them back in their eye clinic every day uh, until that gets under control. Uh, acid burns and lye burns, the big thing here is uh, copious irrigation, copious irrigations. You're not going to put in neutralizing things. Lye injuries, just like on skin, are going to be worse than acid injuries because of the liquefaction necrosis rather than coagulation necrosis uh, and bur burrowing down. So some of these folks, especially the lye injuries, may have to be admitted and irrigated for 24 hours. You may end up having to use the Morgan lenses, realize that those are uncomfortable. You can put tetracaine in, and you're going to wash the tetracaine out within a few minutes of irrigation, which means you're doing a good job irrigating, but your patient's not going to be very happy with you. Sequelae of lye injuries can be very bad. Like this person has just formed horrible... Uh, um, Synechia. Uh, so the eyeball is still good, but they can't see because they have all, all this other scar tissue that's layered down on top of that. It's part of the healing process. Morgan lenses, you're familiar with those. Uh, chemosis, just another kind of chemical allergic reaction. Uh, very alarming looking uh, because the uh, conjunctiva is just puffed up, sometimes to the point where the patient can't even close their eyelids because the conjunctiva sticks out. So. Um, very disturbing. It's going to be antihistamines, uh, topical antihistamines, uh, and reassurance, and you know, irrigating whatever is out. Again, history. What you get exposed to. Go chemosis. Um, starting to spill over time. Or get close to my time. Um, eye pain. Boring eye pain with these really enlarged vessels on there. Think be thinking about some kind of episcleritis, or if it's deeper vessels. Uh, Outright scleritis, it's just this horrible, deep, boring pain in these incredibly injected vessels on the eyeball. Um, so uh, those are basically sentinel hallmarks that there's an underlying um, uh, collagen vascular disease uh, that may not be diagnosed yet on this patient. Uh, steroids, uh, consulting the ophthalmologist uh, and rheumatologic referral for these folks. So scleritis, episcleritis, things to be thinking about. Um, other things in the... Uh, the lacrimal system, you can get uh, abscesses that form here along the nose. Um, uh, they can be start out just with a cyst because of an obstruction and then move on to abscess formation on the face. Uh, like this one here, looks like it's actually starting to drain spontaneously. Uh, and this can move on, if not treated, uh, to a preceptal or even uh, orbital cellulitis. So you need to catch, catch these things and treat those aggressively. Uh, can also be an infection that's up in the lacrimal gland itself. So sometimes you have a patient who has a particularly large gland, you have to pull up the eye and you see something sticking up there in the outer upper quadrant uh, under the lid. Uh, don't start INDing that right off the bat. That might be their lacrimal gland and they're not going to appreciate you taking their ability to make tears. But they can get infected and this is a person at high risk for moving on to a septal, uh, preceptal and septal cellulitis. 
chronic things, chalazions, those are the ones that are there, they don't bother anything, they're just kind of incidental findings, or someone, you know, my family member told me, I should probably see, make sure it's not cancer. Uh, squamous cell cancer can present like that, it's kind of a history, referral to the ophthalmologist, and they can decide if they want to do anything else with it. As opposed to the styes, those are infections. Uh, I've got to give the size and molar glands mentioned. There's a, a piece of anatomy that shows you where those little, little ducts in their glands are. Uh, by and large, the ones that are internal, you can lance on the inside, you can get an 18 gauge needle and flip the top off and treat it with antibiotics. Uh, and do the continued warm compresses uh, and uh, yeah, topical antibiotics. And then other ones to the outside that usually in the heat middle, they'll either resolve or open up. Uh, cellulitis can be the uh, um, in front of the eyeball on the skin, like this kid, clearly she needs antibiotics. Does she need to be in the hospital or in the intensive care unit? Of course not, okay? But she's gonna have to have close follow-up. So she is at risk for moving on that infection down deeper as opposed to the orbital cellulitis. Um, and you can see that this person looks like their gaze is disconjugate. They're not looking in the same direction. It hurts to move the eye around. That's kind of the hallmark to suggest that the process has moved back further into the orbital socket itself which is in the closed space, so it will go on to an abscess and can lose the eye. Or actually see it and uh, it turn into meningitis. So um, you're going to do part of that work up and then transfer them on. Every once in a while you can see some other weird looking things, like the pterygium here. Pterygium pterygy is a wing, so it looks like a wing that's kind of growing over the, uh, over the uh, eyeball, over the cornea itself. They're uh, slow growing, they're benign. Uh, the ophthalmologist will sometimes just shave them off or sometimes uh, loosen them up and turn them back around to let them grow back out again. So if they continue to grow, they'll grow back again. Pterygium, just long-term irritation, ultraviolet light exposure. And then pinguicula, you see those spots. I'm sure you've seen them before, kind of look at it. It's like, I wonder what that is. Okay, I'll refer to the ophthalmologist. They'll figure it out. Um, they're benign, again, long-standing irritation, usually in um, dry environments. Uh, and it's just a little heaped up tissue that's there. No consequence, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything. It just sits there very benignly. Both of these tend to be on the nasal side of the eye. So there they are side by side. Pterygium, pinguicula. They're just cool words. Trauma, penetrating stuff. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, uh, corneal foreign body uh, and lifting those out, say with a needle, make sure that uh, when you're doing that with a needle, that you're, if it's on the nasal side, as you're coming in from the side, that you're not doing a big old corneal abrasion with a shaft of the needle. So you have to come in a little bit steeper angle if you're going across the the arc of the eyeball itself. I had some of our residents kind of learn that the hard way and their patients. Uh, if you've got a rest ring behind, uh, by and large, if it's way out off, off the visual axis, it's not a big deal, but it's kind of fun to play with. You'll use your algebra brush, um, a little spinning drill, also known, sometimes known as eye spud. Uh, you're not going to drill through the eyeball, uh, but it's kind of concerning. You just lay it on there in the corner, almost as like it's made of water, it just kind of splashes when this thing hits it. So if you haven't done that, be prepared. Sometimes a little surprises. Uh, so remove your rest ring, especially if it's in the visual axis, or refer to the ophthalmologist. Here's a little scleral foreign body. Uh, see the little dink there, little metallic spot? Okay. But you want to get your history that I was welding, or excuse me, I was grinding something, and all of a sudden it felt something in my eye. Hmm, okay. But you look a little harder, and uh, when you remove it, this is what you extract. Okay. That is millimeters, so that's a, over a centimeter long. So you know that's a globe penetration. And everybody remember the name of this test? It was the fluorescein in. And look with your slit lamp, and you see the streaming of the fluorescein. It's uh, aqueous humor from the eyeballs running out. It's called Seidel's test. OK, that's what it looks like. More foreign bodies. Never good. I was trimming my nails, and I got there. He's a nail in my eye. OK, haha. -ha. <coughs> Ouch. Uh, and this poor fellow who dug his own eyeball out. It's, he needs a psychiatrist, but he's going to have to have a little uh, surgery first to kind of seal that up. So you're going to protect these uh, folks, uh, keep them NPO, check their tetanus status, uh, plus minus on the antibiotic coverage as you're transferring them on. Lid lacerations, the eyelids do not have fat. So if you see fat protruding, then that is a deeper uh, orbital penetration. Okay. Uh, so, lip uh, lacerations, you sit down, it's like, oh, you know, the ear's not busy, I can sit down, I can sew that up. 
realize that if this is not perfect, then it's going to be like the old windshield wiper that you have a new windshield that doesn't that doesn't smooth away the water very neatly and leaves a streak across your windshield which irritates the crap out of you and invariably is right down your line of vision as you're trying to drive. Everybody familiar with that, right? Okay, it's gonna be the same thing. This has to be perfect. Okay, there's no room for error on this. So, um, there's an example. The, the eye surgeons will actually take their very fine uh, sutures and pass through the openings of some of these glands to keep from causing more trauma trying to pull this back together again and get it all lined up perfectly, okay? So you're not gonna be able to do that with your glasses or your woods lamp, okay? Or even with your slit lamps. This, someone's gonna sit down with vessel loops and take all the time in the world to make sure this is done correctly, <coughs> okay? And anything that's on the medial aspect of the eyelids toward the nose, remember what's there? Your whole lacrimal drainage system. So remember the puncta and the canalicula, okay? That's all sitting there and those sometimes the eye surgeon's gonna have to put uh, silastic stents into to keep them from scarring down because otherwise the patient's not going to be able to remove tears properly from their eye which are being produced constantly and they'll be running down their cheek for the rest of their life. Kind of bad. So I don't want to miss those things. Medial lacerations, bad. Blunt trauma is the last section. Let me blast through this real fast. Uh, maybe as simple as uh, subconjunctival uh, hematomas. They always look alarming. People come in with them. They're scary looking. Uh, we have to just reassure them they're fine. They'll go away. Uh, make sure they're not a, a anticoagulants uh, are causing the problems. Um, so if it's just under the conjunctiva, no problem. Okay, uh, some, someone gets a little pop to the eye, an eyeball, uh, a baseball or something else, hmm, that's fine. You see this kind of doorway diagnosis. You can see this uh, uh, blood that's there in the anterior chamber, hyphema, which is a little closer. There you can see it layering out just like the hypopion, except this is red cells instead of white cells. Uh, Big things here are if it's a significant amount of blood that's in there, uh, they can go on uh, and form uh, scar tissue from that, end up with glaucoma. Uh, a bit higher risk for uh, lens opacification uh, within a few months, just cataract formation. And um, uh, when they're standing up, it'll layer up very nicely if they're laying down like our, a lot of our trauma patients are. It's just going to you know, find that horizontal plane. So you may not see it as well, so here, for example, a significant amount of blood that's there, but you don't see it layering because the patient's laying flat. Another one. Um, uh, that's my son. Uh, and then the eight ball hyphema. Okay, there's so much blood in the anterior chamber that you can't make out any structures in there at all. These have to go to the operating room, they have to be drained, and they're at high risk still for uh, long term problems that I already described. So, hyphemas. Uh, globe ruptures, uh, the teardrop pupil, especially with the iris that's prolapsed out right along the edge of the uh, cornea insertion. So the teardrop points to where the globe rupture is. So you can see that's not, not round. So uh, a lot of times there's a hyphema with that. Here's another example with the iris just prolapsed out of the uh, edge of the cornea. Um, two more examples of those pictures that I took. Uh, lens dislocations, sometimes the lens will get knocked out. Uh, maybe sitting anterior, maybe sitting posterior. Lens freaked me out. There's one with the lens knocked out. It was posterior. I couldn't figure it out why everything was up nice and close when I looked in one eye. And the other eye, which was the affected eye, looked like the, like the, uh, the fundus, uh, the entire retina, everything. It looked like it was just ridiculously far away, like I was looking, with, looking at it with a panoptic scope because there wasn't a lens in the, the present. When I sent it to the ophthalmologist, I was like, what in the heck am I looking at? It's like, well, his lens is out and it's laying in the bottom of his eyeball. That's where I found it. Oh, okay. I don't feel so bad. So lens dislocations. They happen. Okay, that's a good parlor trick, but it doesn't want to be you. So another blunt injury to the eye with the orbital blowout fracture. So thank goodness for the two dudes who jump patients and do all kinds of other things to keep us in business. So not gonna be able to look up with the affected eye because of the uh, um, inferior rectus muscle entrapment. So not everyone that has a blowout fracture has entrapment. That's gonna be the differentiation of do they need to see the eye doctor right now or can they wait a day or two and let things subside. Um, they may complain of diplopia, other places that you can blow out. Uh, remember that your inferior orbital nerve may also be affected with this if you have loss of sensation across the, uh, um, that part of the cheek and down to the lip. If you're doing old fashioned uh, x-rays, uh, then water's view is the way to do that. Hey folks, you're still old enough to remember water's view and all that good stuff? Am I the only one? Okay, I feel old. <clears throat> so, which is the affected eye? The one on the right or the one on, on the left? The patient's right or the patient's left? 
patient left because he can't do it. Right? The other one goes up, this one does not. That's the easy step. Okay. And uh, last thing, okay, I should have hammered through these slides. Um, blow to the eye, uh, one of these was a cane. Someone, one lady, little lady, uh, whacked another one in the face with her cane. I'm sure it was over some big bargain at the, at the big, big box store. Um, and she's now losing her vision on that side. Her CT scan shows that she's actually got a uh, hematoma that's starting to form back behind the eyeball. Uh, she's now developed basically the compartment syndrome. Her eyeball is being pushed forward. Um, there's actually a few technical guys that were looking down the length of his face. You can see one, one orbit, the eyeball's sticking way forward, the other one's uh, way back, and there's outright uh, proptosis of the eyeball over the lids. So these are uh, emergencies. Uh, you have to uh, handle that. So fine, decrease intraocular pressure, but what they really need is the bottom line there, lateral canthotomy. Uh, this is very easily done. Uh, so take your hemostat, uh, actually numb it up the corner of the eye a little bit, get a hemostat, crush the tissue, kind of like if you ever did circumcisions using the, uh, one of the techniques. You do a little crush to exsanguinate the tissue and basically make it so that blood can't flow back into it. You leave that on for about a minute, take it back off, get your scissors, your iris scissors, cut right through that crushed tissue until you hit bone, and then there's another ligament between the bone and the eyeball and you get that ligament, because that's gonna free that up, okay? This is not difficult to do. Just keep the points of your scissors away from the eyeball. I mean, there's lots of room there, you'd be surprised. Uh, it's not that big a deal. Uh, and you're gonna, if, if, you have, if they haven't lost vision yet, uh, you may be able to save their vision. Okay, this is not something that's like, well, it's him and haw, think about it, um, you know, uh, and then an hour later come back with, I think we've decided to do this. This needs to be kind of like right now. Uh, we did one, um, there it is again, uh, on this kid who took a shotgun blast to the face. Uh, we weren't sure yet even if he, you know, how many pellets might have penetrated his eye. He hit the trauma bed, uh, was intubated, and the next thing is like, let's go do lateral panthotomies right now while we're on CT scan. Okay. Uh, he would lose his vision because he had too many globe uh, perforations anyway, but it wasn't because we did not do the right procedure. And my residents appreciate it because they got two eyeballs. So uh, he ended up with other uh, parenchymal bleeds and subdural hematomas. So, okay, we're at the end of my lecture. If you ever wondered what what do bugs see? I'm not exactly sure, but hopefully this is kind of one of the last things that they see. And I will stop. Any questions? Thank you very much.